All right, so the next section of this document has uh, several bullet points next on writing, the actual writing of the blog. Frequency. No matter your schedule, the important thing is to blog consistently. Start off with a once-a-month blog if you're not used to blogging. Once a week is better. Once a day is best. Well, actually, multiple times a day. And the point of this is more content. More content gets you more found. So, if you're doing it once a month, it's good. You're putting stuff out there. The search engines will find you. If you're doing it more often, the search engines will find you faster. So if someone searches uh, how to bake a pie, how to bake a pecan pie, how to bake a traditional pecan pie, and you had written a blog post about that with those keywords and such, you could be found traffic back to your website. So I say here, no matter the schedule. The point is, if you're not blogging right now, you want to start blogging. It's up to you to decide how often, because the main idea here is if you're not blogging, start. And you can decide your schedule as long as you keep to it. Don't beat yourself up though if you set a schedule of once a month and this month you're a week late or three weeks late or a month late. Don't beat yourself up if you miss a month, but do it consistently rather than giving up uh, right away, as often happens in this space. People take this class, they, they get ideas, they want to blog, and then it falls by the wayside more and more, they stop blogging. I'm guilty of it too. If you look at my comic book blog, it, there hasn't been an update in a little while, and I've got so many ideas and stuff to put up there, but I haven't quite gotten to it. That's okay, I'm also... What's that? Oh. So see, we have this networking group of people. <laughs> talk to each other. So, <laughs> look at that, we have a bidding war. So just do it frequently. Decide what your frequency is. Well then that ties into length. I've been saying 100 words, and but that's not set in stone. I have here some ideas. What's the length of the blog? If you're new to blogging, 100 words on a regular basis is a good start. 300 is better, and then of course more is better. If you blog more than once a month, you can vary between 100 to 300 per post. You're going to see, as you start writing, 100 words might zoom by pretty fast. WordPress gives us a little counter on the bottom right corner, I think, uh, of, of our words. So it's going to be telling us our goal. And if our goal is 100 words, we're going to get to that pretty quickly. So not much to say extra there, except you decide how long, how much to write, but I would say a minimum of 100 words. You're going to see many tutorials out there that says, make sure you're writing 500 words every time. That's a lot, especially if you're not used to writing. Maybe start off with 100, and as you get better and more confident and get more ideas, increase the length of your blog posts. But the idea is, what if you do this? Uh, you spend a weekend, write 1,000 words, break that up into several posts. For example, 100 words per post will give me how many posts? 10. I could ring out 10 posts out of those 1,000 words I wrote that weekend. And then of course you can do the math. Well, what if I do a 250 word blog post, well, I, out of that I get four, four posts. And then you can decide, I'm going to be doing posts once a month. Okay, I have ten months of content. Four months of content. Four weeks of content. Ten weeks of content. Ten days of content. Whatever. You don't have to put all of those words out on one blog post. Some of the famous literature, works of literature, were serialized. Dickens was usually serializing his works. A Christmas Carol, Christmas Story or Christmas Carol? The one with the bunny. Just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, 
Christmas, a Christmas Carol, right? Christmas Carol, Dickens. Um, the, uh, he serialized it once a week in the local newspaper. He was putting a chapter at a time or whatever, and then it was eventually collected into the big book that we know nowadays. You could do the same, serialize it, and that's going to get people to come back to read the next, the next part in the series. It's going to get people to subscribe. More traffic. Yes? That answer really depends on your target audience. Maybe you have an audience that is into the long form blog posts. Maybe you have an audience that isn't. The way you find that out is, for example, you set up something like Google Analytics. Uh, we don't have time to do it in this class, but if we do your the S, my SEO class, we talk about linking our blog to Google Analytics, and what Google Analytics will do is track so many statistics. What pages were the most popular? What keywords were the most popular? How long did someone stay on your site? So through those statistics, we're seeing, you know, I'm going to put out, let's say I vary this. This month, 100 words. Next month, 500 words. Next month, 250 words. I'm going to vary it. Because then that's how I figure out my target audience really responded to the 500 words. So I can't say what's too long, what's too short, really. I would say put a variety of content out there. You're doing, in a sense, what is known as A-B testing. Does version A work better than version B? And then that helps me figure out version B is working better. More text with a couple of pictures as opposed to more pictures with a little bit of text. And then too long, you'll figure it out eventually. That's a good idea. When we, that's a good idea. When we talk about the concept of categorizing our posts, we can categorize them that way. Long post, medium post, short post. And um, there's a blog platform, I believe it's called Medium. Um, they're, they're coming up as a competitor to WordPress. Let me just confirm it. I believe it's called Medium. Um, I believe they categorize their... Um, they categorize their blog posts in terms of minutes to read. This is going to be a three-minute read. This is going to be a seven-minute read. That translates to number of words somehow. But uh, yeah, here we go, Medium. Medium.com is a community of readers and writers offering unique perspectives on ideas large and small. Basically, it's a blog, a blog platform. It's a competitor to WordPress. How big is it? I don't know, but I am seeing it here and there more in tech circles. Just because new things come out, people try them out, they may stick, they may not. But you're going to see titles, descriptions, categories, tags, comments. This looks like WordPress, but it's not WordPress. <laughs> I'm not sure, actually. I haven't looked at it enough to be fully educated in it, but you can look it up on their site. I haven't... I have... Um, I have a feeling it's free. Yeah, or if it's not free, it's probably in the style of freemium, which is you get the free version, which has a lot of great stuff, and then like the extra little uh, icing on the cakes uh, is a little bit extra to pay for. But that's just something to look into. Frequency, length, you should be getting an idea it's pretty open-ended. The point is to do it. Some more specific things about then when we're writing is a title. You have a um, blog post 
and for example, cranberry pound cake with praline frosting, November 18th, 17 comments, text, picture. We'll go into the anatomy of a post in a, in a, in a moment, but part of the anatomy is its title. So the title, what's the title of this, of this blog post? Pretty obviously, you might think cranberry pecan pound cake with praline frosting. That's half true. The other title for this blog post is cranberry pecan pound cake. The address. The address, the web address of that, the URL, doesn't mention the praline frosting part of it. So my point there about a title is we're going to write something that is descriptive of the blog post, of course, using keywords that people might be searching for to find you. And this particular title has what is known, and you, in, this happens automatically all the time, and this is not bad, but stop words. Words that the search engines ignore, like the, and at, and this, and with. The search engines are looking at meaningful words. Cranberry, cake, praline. It's going to ignore at, the, this, uh, with. Those are stop words. The search engines don't look at that. And that's reflected up here. This is not quite a complete sentence. Cranberry pecan pound cake. It's the keywords of this particular blog post. Uh, can I ask, uh, that's a little distracting, can you not quite do it at this point, please? Yeah. Uh, so the title, this is the human readable version for people, but then we have to think about it also in the terms of the search engine. So my note here, description, uh, title, try for a short, memorable, and direct title. Think of, think in terms of content that people need and want to read. My review on the Toshiba T75, a winner. That's the version of the title that people would look for or read, but the stop words here, my, on, the, uh, and the main keywords that perhaps this article has on my website would be review-toshiba-t75. You're going to see in a moment when we, set, when we get into WordPress, we can craft this how we want, because by default, WordPress will take whatever you wrote as a title and just put the whole thing up onto the address. And not that that's bad, because it is going to take the keywords that you wrote and such. But what would be better is to craft a title, an address of your blog post that omits the stop words, that omits the irrelevant words, and focuses on the keywords of what your blog post is about. We'll see how to do that. So on my notes here, regarding title, there's two of them. The human readable version with stop words. And then the URL, uh, the uh, search engine friendly version. It's the URL, it's the address of, of your website uh, without stop words. And we're able to edit both of them pretty easily with WordPress. We'll see how. Yeah. You didn't just say that Google will get rid of them. No, Google, uh, well, Google is not going to get rid of them from your site, but it's not going to pay attention to them. Right. So we may as well craft our keyword, our titles, that they don't use it anyway. That way, um, we have our focused keywords right in our address bar uh, for the search engine to index. Um, <clears throat> when you do a search, on, let's just as an example, I'm going to go to some other search engine, Bing, and I'm going to search for here how to invest in ETFs. Uh, so you're going to see ads, of course, but then you're going to see 
how to invest in ETFs from eHow.com, from ETFVB.com, why invest in ETFs, ATF investing, how to invest in exchange traded funds, how to invest in ETFs from the Wall Street Journal. I notice they're not the number one result. The Wall Street Journal is a big name in finance, but they're not the number one result. eHow.com is. And second is this one, and that one, CBS News, and then Wall Street Journal. So this should show you that even the big, big names in a particular space might not be number one, especially if your particular content is of better quality uh, than the competition. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, but does, would that matter based upon your, your results? Will it depends upon your location, right? There's many factors, and in the SEO class we go into more detail, but one of the factors is um, you know, the title that's written, which we just mentioned, and I was going to segue into the description also. So this text that is appearing below a search result, this description, this is something we can also craft, and that you should. This is judging the book by its cover. This is your chance to make that first impression. Uh, and so... Um, in my document in about 150 characters because you don't have a lot of space to write a lot of things here. Eventually it gets cut off. Notice how that gets cut off right there. That got cut off. If you can craft your message in this short amount of space here without losing your thought, that's better. And that's about 150 characters, although that changes. Google changed it recently. It used to be more you, you could have more space to write there. Now it's a little less space because they've also increased the size of their font. So they've increased the size of their font, and then you no longer have as much space to write. Does anyone remember? There used to be numbers next to these. I think there used to be number one result, number two result, etc. I don't see numbers anymore. So the search engines change, is the point. So at the moment, 150 characters, you should be able to explain what your post is about to people who come across it in a search results page, entice them to click and read. So people sometimes think SEO is, I'm going to go to my homepage, I'm going to optimize my homepage, put my keywords, a great title, great description, and I'm done. No, you have to do that to every page. The homepage, the about page, the contact page, and all 20 of your blog posts. So yes, it could be some amount of effort, especially if you've made a website a year ago and only optimized the home page. Or optimized every page with the same content. That's not so good. You want to add a good title and description to every page of your site. So the description is the snippet. Mm -hmm. The snippet that appears in. We'll see in WordPress we've got a box that we can fill in. Uh, that this will then take the custom, yes. So my note here is the snippet of text the search engines display. This morning I found a really cool thing on Yoast.com to explain the snippet of how to I'm not sure if I've mentioned it in this class, but uh, if I didn't, uh, make a note that uh, the website uh, Yoast.com is a great website about uh, SEO. Great SEO website. They sell a product about SEO, of course, but they give away a lot of free SEO information on their blog. And that's the model of many websites nowadays. They might be selling a service or a product or whatever, but they give a lot of stuff away on the blog. Maybe like I said about my recipe, maybe I'm not going to give away grandma's recipe, but I'm going to give away a version of that recipe so that you can do it yourself at home. Maybe I write a blog post, do it yourself uh, pecan pie, because people want to do it themselves. And then they make their own recipe and I get traffic and such. But then people buy the real grandma's recipe. Yes? You know that class week, I think it was this one you mentioned, uh, Yoast, that, that plug-in. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll tell you, that's made a difference for me because when I write my blogs, it has this little thing that checks everything from title mm -hmm. to words to uh, keywords to 
and it kind of gives you a from a yellow to a green. You know, if I've got it done, from a red to you're describing here, description, title, length is all in mm -hmm. that little section, which really helps. Yeah, so Yoast, not only can you read up on things and, and uh, keep up to date, they also offer a plugin for WordPress where it will analyze your site and rank your pages from red, actually, to green about how good your SEO is. And uh, we don't get to it in this class because our WordPress.com does not have the ability to use plugins. You would need your self-hosted WordPress, the one that you buy, victor.com, instead of getting the free victor.wordpress.com. So in the other class, the, word, the other WordPress class I teach, we do talk about installing the plugin and using it. But the point of that plugin is that it helps you craft your title and your description, and it analyzes and telling you, you've got stop words here getting in your way, you don't have enough text, etc. It's a recommended plugin. This uh, description, again, this is your chance to make a first impression. Uh, you have this amount of space to tell people why would they want to click on this particular result. Like this stands out for me, a beginner's guide. There are several other ways in which ETFs beat out mutual funds. Wait a minute, I've got all my money in mutual funds and you're saying this is better? I want to read that. So, this is where you catch people's attention to, um, to, to have you read. Notice in my results page here, I'm also seeing videos. Investopedia video, four reasons for ETFs. How to invest in ETFs, three minutes or four minutes. How to invest in gold ETFs, five minutes. Should I invest in mutual funds or ETFs? Four minutes. So another way to quote unquote blog, these would be called vlogs with a V, video blogs. Obviously this takes a different sort of effort, but making short one minute, two minute, five minute videos on a topic and uploading them to YouTube and such could get more traffic. You can embed your video on your blog so that they, so someone that wants to read the content can read the content. Someone that then wants to view it or listen to it has an audio version, like the podcast, but video. Images. Choose images that relate to the topic. Use your own original images or appropriate stock images also known as royalty-free images, public domain images. And this always comes up, it might have even been asked previously, and now's the time to talk about it in more detail. Images. You can easily do a search on any search engine and find a million results on any topic you want. And that picture will look great on my website. But I would recommend do not use any picture that you find online for your website. And that is very restrictive, obviously, because there's a million pictures enticing me to be used. No, I would recommend you don't use anyone's picture that you did not create, just to be safe from possible copyright violations. Even though it's so easy to look up pictures about any topic, even this one about ETFs, okay, that'll look great on my, uh, on my blog about ETFs, that one will look great. I have no idea if that's okay for me to use. Just because Google shows it doesn't mean it's okay. Just because Bing produces a million results doesn't mean it's okay for me to use on my website. Because someone created that to go on their own website. Someone was hired to design it, probably. Someone owns that. This is intellectual property. You know, um, physical things uh, have ownership and such. Digital things have ownership. And so, I would not recommend to just do any sort of search and grab a picture. Unless you're searching for, with the keywords, stock image, royalty-free image, public domain image. If we search for those kinds of pictures and with those keywords, hopefully we get results that fall into those three categories. And those are the categories of pictures that you'll be safe to use.
Um, or go directly to a website like this one that I mentioned that's all about free images. Pixabay.com. There's many websites out there. Here's just one that I'll mention because we could be swapping links all day long. But this one, taking a quick look, Pixabay.com, P I X A B A Y.com. It's a search engine for images, royalty free images, free images free high quality images over over half a million free uh, free photos vectors and art illustration free images and videos videos you can use anywhere all images and videos on pixabay are released free of copyrights under creative commons version 0 you may download modify distribute and use them royalty free for anything you like even commercial apps applications because you may look up on Google and find a picture that is royalty free only for the web but here we can get this picture that looks amazing and that will also look amazing on my menu I can put it in the background that's a commercial purpose free to use so you're not gonna find the same millions of results I only found 213 results here, and I can pro probably find 200,000 million on Google. But look at this. These are some good pictures that I can use for my website that are free, high quality. I can modify them. I can put in my own company name right here in the middle of it. I can open up Photoshop and edit it, and it's fine. These other ones that you might stumble across them on the web, I, I'm wary. So I'm going to guide you to going to this particular website for example where you have these images that you can use safely the only thing that's a little annoying is when you do a search here the very first row of results are actually sponsored results skip the first row these are all sponsored by Shutterstock, and then at Shutterstock you go and you buy the images. Skip the first row, look at the rest. And so on any particular image you can view it and you can download it at different sizes. I think this large one is still a little too large for the web, for my blog post. Medium is usually good, 1280 pixels, that's good but it gives you the 5,000 pixel size one. That's print quality. That's poster size for free. Which size? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Which size is this for Facebook posting? The Facebook posting. Um, the small, I think, is still too small. I would be fine getting the medium one, and Facebook will shrink it down to the right size. This is a good trade-off between small, which I think is too small, and large, which is obviously way too big. I'd be safe with medium, usually. And so you can find um, you can find a variety of pictures, and then you can look at a person's profile and then see all of the uh, all of the variety of pictures that they offer. And you can follow them, and whenever they post a new picture, you get a notification and such. So people put these out there. Uh, for free or, or for for sale and such. I actually have an account here with a few pictures um, that have been vaguely popular. Um, this one right here, people like that picture of mine. It's got um, 2,000 views, 1,000 downloads. Did anybody buy any cup of coffee? Not yet. But I'm, I'm not in it for the coffee. Yes. That would be my question. What is the benefit? What, do, what benefit do you have by giving away free images? Traffic. I have my account. People can click on my account, view my account, and on my account I'm going to have links to my Twitter or my homepage or to my products or whatever. So again, when you're walking around the mall and someone's passing out these little cards, a lot of people are going to ignore that. Some people are going to take the card and buy the item. Same thing here. It's just a numbers game. The more you do, the better. Um, I'm giving away stuff here, uh, and 
my purpose, my personal purpose, is just to put a cool picture and get a little fleeting inter internet fame. But another aspect of doing this is to drive traffic back to your properties, back to your website and Twitter and so forth. And so this one's also got 177 downloads and, and so forth. So that's the thing about images. On a technical level, make sure your file names are meaningful and that you've added alt text to each. So my note here is... Question. Yes. How important are tags on a photo? I see Yoch does that when I do a post, you know, so you don't have tags. Alt tags? Is that, is that what they're referencing to? It, sh it should be saying alt tags text rather than tags. Okay, tags well, is something else. It should be saying alt text. I'm is that pretty the sure. Same thing, alt text and alt tags? It's interchangeable, but the correct term is alt text. Okay. People often say alt tags, but technically it's not a tag, it's it's text. They're interchangeable. But the point is that yes, which is what my note here says, uh, make sure we use alt text. We'll see what that is exactly, but alt text is a text description of what a picture is. Because the smartest computers out there are still too dumb to really tell you what a picture is. Um, if, if I ran this picture through the smartest computers at Google or Bing, they won't be able to tell you what it is very accurately. They might be able to tell you people in some event. They're never going to be able to tell you if this was held at this college for a particular cultural event. There's no computer smart enough for that. Maybe a computer will tell you this is a person, but they'll never be able to tell you this is our new school president, unless there is alt text attached to the picture which is a text description that we write that explains what the picture is. Another spot for us to write these keywords and these important descriptions for us to be found. So make sure you use alt text on your pictures. The search engines will then understand what the picture is. But on another aspect, alt text is important because that, ex that enhances your accessibility. So, alt text enhances accessibility. And accessibility is this big topic about, is your website accessible? Is it usable by everyone? So, for example, did you know that, you, that people that are completely blind can still use the internet? They can still use the web. You might think, the web is very visual. How will a blind person know to click on that to follow a link? How will a blind person know that picture is of this cultural event? Alt text. Because the person that needs it has a particular computer or software that will read to them what's on the screen. This is screen reader software. So if I were vision impaired, I would still be able to have a computer. I'd have a special keyboard. And, and mouse and such, but then I would visit a website and the computer would read to me link <coughs> programs, link student services, link certificate programs, link organization. And then on my special keyboard, I know that if I press control 3, it'll go to the third link that it read to me so they can manage my through my website. Then the screen reader will get to image, 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 and it won't be able to say anything about it unless we add alt text. It'll say image, cultural event 2015. Image, new president named. Image, um, literary, literary, what is that? Military friends. Military friends, etc. So alt text. We'll see in WordPress how to do it, but we want to add alt text. We, this is alternative text, alternative to the picture. And so this is something codified in state and federal law. State and federal websites are required to have accessibility features. And one of the most basic features is add alt text to a picture. That's state and federal requirements. However, it's 
also becoming an aspect of good business. Um, retailers, Walmart, Target, etc., have been brought to task for not being accessible. I'm blind, but I want to buy something from Target, but I can't manage the website. There's no alt text. I don't know what I'm buying. Uh, Walmart or other retailers and other retailers have also added accessibility features to their website so that they can get customers. So on that aspect, every customer is welcome. On a on a uh, you know government and educational aspect, everyone is welcome to the website to use the website to register for classes, etc. Because of accessibility, a little thing like adding alt text to your pictures. <laughs> It helps your SEO, but better yet, it helps the people manage your website so that you can get those customers, so that you can get those potential clients, so that you can get whatever you're trying to do online. And then the file name is also meaningful. If you take your picture right out of your digital camera, because I said use your own original pictures or stock images. If you use your own picture that you took from your own camera and upload it to your WordPress, you'll probably get a picture called img underscore 98472.jpg. Bad. You want something called product um, cupcake pecan large dot jpg. Good. The search engines look at that also. You might not. No, this is the file name. The alt text is in a different part in WordPress. This is something outside of WordPress. So you might not have even thought of that. I'm just putting my photos on, on my website. But if they're named something like that, image 3589, that is not as good as your images. Also having your keywords and such, what is the picture about? Search engines will see that. <coughs> it's something to think about as well. Is, it, is there a link on the a, a limit on the length of the name? I've run into that in some of the programs. There's a technical limit. Uh, I believe on Windows, the maximum length of a file name is 255 characters. So there's a technical built-in operating system limit. Um, I think the Mac has a limit as well. So there's a technical limit. But there should, there's also a limit conceptually in that you're not going to stuff as many keywords here as you can. Again, concise to the point about what the picture is. Because at a certain point, you can over-optimize. And then, as I said previously, the search engines, unfortunately, are all about guilty until proven innocent guilty by association, shoot first, ask questions later. And so if you are engaging in a lot of these tactics that seem artificial, over the, over the, over the top, spammy, you will be marked as a spammer. And then it's going to be hard to get out of that, that hole that you've been put into. It's also hard to manage your images. I mean, you can't do a, a query on it when you're doing, when you're doing um, when you're managing all your images and they all have all these unique names, there's no way of separating them or, or mm -hmm. one of uh, one of the downsides of WordPress is that yes, you cannot create folders and put your pictures into folders and so forth. WordPress manages it for you. But if you use good file names, you WordPress does have a search feature. It does have a way for you to search the names of your files and such. Okay. And when we upload a picture, we'll see we can we can set also a description, an internal description. Okay. And then that way when we search, we can find our own pictures. So yeah, that's one of the things that definitely I would say is a downside of WordPress. There's not too many, but here's one, and it's kind of a big one. You cannot create a folder structure for you to put in all your cupcake pictures into the one cupcake folder. The closest to it is that it, up, it, it organizes it in terms of months days and years and you can do searching but if all your images are called image 9857 good luck yeah. images headings uh, this will make more sense once we actually create this 
post, but we're, we're going to talk about headings. Uh, in general, um, let me show it this way. The syllabus that you, that you probably still have, if you have a copy of it handy, uh, I'm going to pull it up here, just the, the PDF. My syllabus uh, adheres to many of the topics that I talk about in that, in that checklist, even though it's not a blog, but my, ch my syllabus itself, in a sense, is, is optimized, in a sense, in that if this was a website, it has, for example, what I've mentioned in that point, headings. I've got a chunk of content with a heading that delineates what that content is. Another heading, another heading, another heading. Course information. So I've designed my syllabus with sections. Your blog posts, as necessary, you should also break up your content into sections with headings. We'll see that we can mark headings easily. And I've got the same idea in this PDF. There's a heading for a section, planning. There's a heading for a section, writing, and a section for promoting. On a technical level, these are known as headings, HTML headings. We'll see that we can add them really easily in WordPress very soon. But the search engines love this. The search engines love that you create headings. And this is simply not making the text big and bold and red. This is selecting the formatting option that turns this into a heading. The search engines look for that. Did you use the proper tool for the job. If I simply bold it and make it big, that's not good. If I select heading 1, heading 2, heading 3, that's good. They are useful for breaking up a wall of text into readable sections and help the search engine understand your content. The search engine will analyze every page of your website, every screen of your website, and when it comes to a particular screen, it'll look for headings. Is the content broken up into digestible pieces? logical pieces, like my syllabus, for example, like that PDF, for example. Because when you saw my syllabus, and you can be honest, you might not have read it from top to bottom. You might have jumped to a particular section. What are the learning outcomes? And you read that. Maybe you jumped over, what's the textbook? Maybe you never read the first section because it didn't interest you. That's fine. You read the part that interested you, that interested it, you. And so if you just have a big wall of text, that's going to that's gonna blur in people's minds. They're not going to read it. If you divide it into sections, if you divide it into sections, um, into sections, then you won't uh, have people abandoning your your article halfway through because it's too long. Five alternatives to investing in the stock market. Bonds, I don't care. Annuities, I don't care. P2P loans, I care. Let me read that. So I'm not going to go in and reach every, read every paragraph but the people will read what they care about, and maybe they'll read the rest. Maybe you want them to read everything. Honestly, people will not read everything. Dedicated people will, of course, but uh, we've got so much to do nowadays. Give me the important stuff I want to read about gold. So I go to that section. These are headings. They break up a wall of text into readable chunks, and the search engines love them, because it shows that you took time to craft your posts and really make something readable and enjoyable, and you could then get good search engine results. So headings are used to break up lots of text into bite-sized pieces. And like it or not, and maybe you, this doesn't apply to you, but our attention spans are getting shorter. And then so breaking stuff up into short sections will let people read what they care about. And maybe they read one out of the seven things you wrote in that article, but they liked that one thing enough that they clicked share on Facebook. Free traffic. 
you just got more views on Facebook. Then the other people that see that, they read three out of the seven things. And maybe a few people read all seven things. More traffic to your website. Lists, either bullet point or numbered lists, are useful because they create bite-sized pieces of content that people can consume easier. Your title might derive from the type of list you've written, the top three best WordPress tutorials. So I believe we talked about this previously. Uh, so basically any number for a top X list. Blog posts about the top five this, the top five that, the top 12 that. Uh, I just had one up right here. It didn't exactly say the top five whatever, but it said five alternatives to investing in the stock market. Bite-sized information. I, I have limited time, but I have time to read five quick things. Yes. Um, so based on your topic of what you're writing, you can probably think of a few list type of posts. Again, I'm not saying do a list post every time. I'm saying to break things up, you might think about doing a list post at some time. Links. A relevant internal link to your own blog posts is helpful for keeping people on your site longer. A link to an external link is helpful when trying to get backlinks. When setting external links, remember to make them open in their own tab. So I've got here the concept of internal and external links. Internal links. A link from one of your posts on your site to another post on your site. So I'll go back to that investing article. I saw a bunch of little links sprinkled throughout the article because I might say, in general, why bonds are good. But in that one paragraph, it's not enough space to really explain why bonds are good. So there's probably a link in that paragraph that you can click on to then go to another post that is much more detailed about bonds. So internal links keep people on your site longer link from one of your posts to another site keeps people on your site longer. That's good because as they stay longer on my site, they may decide to buy a product, subscribe to my newsletter, subscribe to my blog, hire me, contact me, who knows, whatever you've got set up on your website that keeps them on your site longer. External links. A link from your post to someone else's post. Some other site. In the SEO class, we talk about backlinks. They're also known as inbound links, incoming links, links from someone else's website to my website. The search engines look at that also. If you have a competitor, uh, Bing is looking at both of your websites, and then it sees that on your competitor's website, other people's websites are linking to them. Let's say five links. And on yours, you don't have any. Bing is then going to say that other one is more relevant. Other people are linking to that site because of relevant information. <coughs> Yours, in Bing's view, in Google's view, is not so important. Your website is not so important to rank you because no one's linking to you. Um, and so there's a whole art and a science of getting backlinks. But one of the ways is that from your blog post, you link to someone else's blog post. 
because WordPress, since the majority of websites are WordPress, WordPress automatically alerts another WordPress site, you've got a link. In our WordPress interface, we'll see there's a screen that will tell us how many sites are linking to us. So the point of this, I'm linking to some other website related to food. That other website gets a notification that says you've got a new link, and then it's up to that other website to then say thank you and move on, or say thank you, read your stuff and say this is good, let me link back. So that's phishing for external links. If I link to some other site, I might get a link back. It might not be right away, it might not be ever. But the more you engage in this, and I'm not saying put 40 links from your blog post to 40 other websites, that's spammy. Could you you want to put WordPress it lets you know that somebody has linked to you? Mm -hmm. You know you know what URL that is? Yeah. What, okay. You get that information of where the link came from and everything. Okay. Google Analytics will also tell us that. I have to fully research it, but since the majority of websites are WordPress, definitely you see that in WordPress. But in Google Analytics, it doesn't have to be another WordPress site. That will tell you if it's a non-WordPress site linking to your site. And, link, and doing external links is in the service of getting backlinks also known as inbound links, also known as incoming links, also known as positive SEO juice. No, I made that one up. So um, that's why you want to link elsewhere. Looking at this article here, let's see what we've got. Five alternatives. This is a link. If I hover my mouse over it, it goes over back. It stays on their site, investorjunkie.com. It goes over to alternative investments on their own site. Browse around, higher yield, another one of their own articles. This one is going over to myfico.com, getting started with P2P lending. So this website is linked to a completely different website giving them free traffic, yes, but there might be reciprocal traffic from myfico.com back to Investor Junkie. We wouldn't know that ourselves, but they'll know it within their own system inside the dashboard or Google Analytics and such. A couple more, then we'll take a break. We won't be able to do this one just yet, until we create our WordPress site, I mean post, but we want to organize. We want to use categories and tags. WordPress allows us to categorize and to tag our posts. Categories, let's say I've got this bakery site, and I'm going to be blogging about baked goods. Use categories as the largest organizational unit. Cakes, pies and cookies. So a blog post about pecan pie, lemon meringue pie, etc. I could have blog posts about cakes, birthday cake, wedding cake, divorce cake, and cookies. So a bunch of cookies there, chocolate chip cookies, raisin roundies, etc. Uh, so different recipes into their own category. Tags are the fine-tuned organizational units. Chocolate, sugar-free birthday. Chocolate, I could have a, a, an article about chocolate cake, chocolate cookies, chocolate pies. They're going to be in those different categories, so therefore people can search or browse in those categories, or people can search the tag, the keyword, chocolate, and find that chocolate pecan thing and you know each of the chocolate related things so we'll see in WordPress how to do that and this is recommended because this organizes your site and if you're started if your site is organized then Google and Bing could understand your site better and when someone searches for do-it-yourself pecan pie recipes do-it-yourself pecan pie chocolate pie recipe then your site could show up your post could show up because it was organized into those categories that the search engine found 
author page is a little more advanced, but this makes more sense as in guest blogging, for example. So right here, uh, Miranda Marquit wrote for Investor Junkie. I can click on her name and it goes to her author page where it says a little bit about herself, all the articles she's written for this website, and a link back to her own Google profile. This is this guest writing concept. I go to someone else's website and I write something there and they're going to most likely give me some sort of author page where I can write whatever they let me write, but usually at least a link back to my website, my Twitter, my Google+, my store, whatever. So that's a possible reason why you might also want to set up an author page, especially if you're doing guest blogging. Um, more traffic. This Investor Junkie site gets a lot of traffic, and she's getting some of that residual traffic back to her Google+, where then she could be contacted or hired or whatever. So on my notes, organize your content. Use categories and tags. What I'm going to say about categories, again, uh, there's a certain point where it becomes spammy. You do too much of it, and then the search engines get weary, and then you get penalized. But for categories, I would say one to three per post. Even though I could put 30 categories spanning, one to three. Can I choose between one and three categories that really define what this post is about? Tags. On that one, we can, we can be a little bit more specific, 5 to 10 per post. So the category of cake for a post, and then it's got chocolate, sugar-free, uh, birthday. And it's very confusing for beginners, honestly. When should I use a category? When should I use a tag? Really think about it in terms of you've got a file cabinet. You've got two file cabinets. One file cabinet is for the year 2015. Another file cabinet is for the year 2014. Within the file cabinet, then I have January folder, February folder, December folder. So tags are the folders, categories are the filing cabinets, the large organizational units. Everything related to 2015 is in one file cabinet, one category. Everything then that is specific to a particular event is in a folder or a month or whatever. Tags. But these are obviously better than these physical objects because you can have more than one category, more than one tag. Within reason, of course. One to three categories, five to ten posts. Yes. Yeah, chocolate. Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't make the category, uh, the tag, sugar-free cake. I would make it sugar-free because I could have a sugar-free cake, sugar-free cookie, sugar-free cupcakes. If I define a tag as sugar-free cake, I might as well make it a category. All sugar-free cakes are then going to be categorized under category. But if I simply tag it as sugar-free, I could apply that same tag to any cake that is sugar-free, any cupcake that is sugar-free. So when someone searches sugar-free on my website, it will show them sugar-free cakes, cookies, pies. If someone searches for sugar-free cakes, they'll only see sugar-free cakes, which would be better as a category. Let me show you an example of that. I'm sure we can find it here. Let's show you just an example on mine my blog, my comic blog. So I've got this blog post here. My particular theme shows category Comic Con and video. So any posts that use video will show up in this screen of video. So
So this one about Comic-Con, this one about this particular comic, and that particular comic. These use video because I put them into the video category. Anyone related to Comic-Con will show up here, if it's video or audio or whatever. And then I put in these tags, cosplay, costume, Marvel. So anything related to Marvel, I click there, and it'll show me this one about costumes, this one about this Marvel comic, this one about that Marvel comic. It's just different ways to, to organize. All comics that are issue number eight will be tagged together. So when someone searches or clicks, it'll show that. At the moment, there's only one in the whole blog. There's only one comic that is number eight. If I had a tag number one, all number one books up here. So organization. Lastly, then we'll take a break. Read more. On your blog page, only include a snippet of the post and the option for people to read more, also known as continue reading. So you see that all the time. I've got it on mine. If someone goes to the blog, to the blog screen, the home page here, they see a picture, a title, a snippet of info, continue reading. They might not be interested in that. They're interested in this one, so then they continue reading. On this website over here, how to transfer brokerage accounts. Little snippet, but I can click to read the whole thing with the charts and everything. What about this one? How to successfully profit from market downturns. That sounds interesting. I read the snippet, I read more. And then it's the full 500 words. So the reason I say that is, if you've got your all of your 100 words, all of your 500 words on the blog page, this is going to be a long blog page, a lot of text for people to ignore. Not everyone is going to be interested in a particular post, but they're going to have to scroll through it to get to the next post. So if you put a snippet, read more, they'll be enticed to read more. Why is it NSFW? So you can click to read more. And we'll see that we can do that in WordPress. Read more. The default is that it is not set to read more. Your whole 500 words will show up there. I'll show you how to set it to read more. <coughs> On the post itself, set up a way for related posts to be visible. You see this all the time. You read this particular article, and then on the side or at the bottom or somewhere, it's going to tell you suggested articles. Seven outcomes to expect when a downturn in the market occurs. How to manage your finances through volatile times. Nine things you'll need to survive market downturn. So I read another one. And then I read that one and I get informed. And then that's going to have another suggested. When the stock market starts falling, what's the best investment strategy? We'll see that in WordPress, we can activate that. And I think we mentioned it last time. So here, you read this one. It's a little text, mostly video. And then at the bottom, why not also check out this one? So the purpose of my blog is just to read this. Have fun, look at these comics, and discuss it and whatever. And that's it. Your particular one, you might, try to, you, you might be trying to get hired, giving free advice. Um, whatever you're trying to do online. The longer you keep them on the site and convince them that you're authority and authority, the better. Let's read more. Let's take a break and when we come back we'll look at the third section, promoting. Because you've planned your blog, you've written your blog, you need to then promote it.